First of all, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I thank Shubankar and Shilpi for uh, uh, creating this great forum. I thank all my panelists uh, who will uh, definitely support me in the next 45 minutes to cover uh, some of the issues what we have discussed. Uh, uh, before we really start a panel discussion, you know, I would like to, you know, um, uh, I know there are no guidelines for the panel discussion, but basically I am sure my panelists will help me to, you know, address this question of infrastructure readiness for uh, ushering in this uh, M2M uh, this thing in India. Uh, as you realize, this is a very broad theme. In fact, when I came in in the morning, I was really wanted to know, but my earlier speakers have provided a lot of information, a lot of uh, data on what we look forward. This is one. In fact, uh, every citizen, every transaction, uh, you know, is involved in some way or other in M2M transaction. Uh, for example, telephone calls, or electronic money transfers, email, thread and so on and so forth. In fact, yesterday I was in some meeting where I heard a very interesting uh, MTM intervention of a particular city. Uh, one of the developers, one of the application developers has sent an application for informing a you know resident and how how the, when the water will start in his house. For example, water distribution issue, where a resident uh, doesn't know what time. In fact, I'm talking about. I come from Bangalore. I know similar similar cases with Chennai and other places where. Uh, you don't know when the water comes in the system, you know, morning, evening, what day, they don't know. But these guys have done a system where a resident gets informed by SMS, you know, uh, how, when the water would come for two hours or one hour, whatever is there. I think it's a great service given the type of thing. Well, we have, we can't, well, we can't improve the water distribution system at least residents informed about it. But I don't know how they do it because in Bangalore, there are about 7,000 valve operators, you know, these valve guys who come and, you know, change the walls they move from lane to lane and do this and in Delhi also similar number maybe 9,000 wall operators must be there but I don't know how they get the timings when they will operate which wall and so on and so forth but these guys are able to do this you know it's a fantastic way it's a, currently a man to machine system but I'm sure it could become a <laughs> machine to machine system why I'm saying this the entire uh, gambit of this M2M the core is the individual and the human being you know ultimately you know core is the human being Unless if it's useful to him, you know, it's no, no use of any creating infrastructure. So uh, without uh, going further, I would really request my panelists to address three things. Uh, one is how uh, the M2M infrastructure will evolve in the next five years' time. This is one, one issue. Uh, because uh, we have seen a lot of devices already entering into the market. We have seen the applications. We have heard the speakers talk about this. Then uh, secondly, what will be the expectations of the service provider, you know, behind the infrastructure? Because infrastructure is there, you know, what do they expect from a uh, service provider in terms of, uh, you know, citizen engagement and citizen what we do? And then how does it work in terms of whether the need will follow infrastructure or uh, infrastructure will follow the need? Because there have been cases where, uh, you know, uh, you know, infrastructure follows the needs. And for example, in the telecom industry, example is where, you know, uh, the for example the SIMs and the low package uh, delivery systems, you know, prepaid, uh, you know, uh, packages, you know, 10 rupees type of framework, they all come because of the needs of the individual. They, they will cater to a last very day matter. Or you put the infrastructure first and the needs will be get fulfilled. This one in, in interesting observation I want panelists to make. And of course, uh, I've already, Mr. Dr. Agarwal has really talked about the policy perspectives. I don't want to really get, I had my list saying, what do you think the policy perspectives which could be? you know, important for the MPM industry. So I stop here, then I'll ask, uh, you know, uh, to start with, I'll ask, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Kishore to start this discussion. Sir, uh, I would like to really, uh, we are uh, four or five of us, maybe about five, ten minutes. Sure, sure. Thank you so much. In fact, this topic is uh, so close to my heart, I can talk for days together. But all the same, uh, let's see what we can cover within next limited time. Uh, when we talk about infrastructure, it's very, in fact, before discussing infrastructure, we need to talk about technology, where we are today. And when we talk about M2M, what are the different uh, ways people uh, look at M2M? Uh, from, uh, the, there are two ways, or rather three different distinct definitions floating in the, or the uh, representation of M2M floating in the society or in the ecosystem. Uh, one group, you know, defines it as a, as a very vague, glossy picture of like smart homes, smart buildings, smart grids, smart cities and all that, this thing. Another group 
is focused on telemetry and you know mobile centric uh, you know sim centric uh, m to m or internet of things this thing and the third uh, group talks about it one box uh, a base like in each home in each uh, building you need to have a box which get, then gets connected to the internet so these are three perspective we have to look at it and then accordingly we can talk about infrastructure you know so uh, when you talk about one box for a small office for uh, for a home i think one box approach is very right when we talk about uh, you know um, uh, vehicles moving i think the telemetry or the uh, sim centric uh, scenario is pretty valid and when we talk about this glossy picture of smart home smart building smart this thing uh, but the most unfortunate part in this smart home smart building smart cities is these are being you know pursued by in, in vertical silos as mr loop very rightly mentioned but actually technologies are horizontal the applications are different verticals that is how we leverage the different technologies so we need to, the, the when we talk about technologies uh, in, uh, coming to since we talked about sim and uh, internet of things is all about internet and the basic concept people think the moment i get onto internet my every problem is solved but so the last mile connectivity is the major challenge while building a valid infrastructure for any application and that's where the uh, on the sim I, I'll, i'll touch one one basic aspect when we talk about critical infrastructure or any services what we need is uh basically th this kind of a service uh, providers which control the sims this needs to go away in m2m space we need a, 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 a business model of mvno you know mobile virtual network operator <coughs> who will basically and we talk we need to have embedded sims which basically get sold on the product when they are manufactured so those sims have to be enabled by the subscription management you know roam, roaming steering they have to be enabled by your uh, subscription management quality of service uh, you know monitoring so whenever a uh, um, product manufacturer or system manufacturer makes a modem or a device with a embedded sim you know he just has some test subscriptions okay say 500000 so that he tests the boxes and ships them out the manufacturer does not know where this box will be deployed in which state of a particular country or maybe wherever so when a particular user or a, or a service provider uh, deploy uh, when i say service provider means mtm services not the telecom service providers when he deploys a particular service he has to then just talk to that one single mvno agency you know that okay i uh, i have got these services to be enabled i need these services to be enabled and i need these thousand subscription and this whatever can and sls have to be in place before and in rp drp when since uh, he talked about smart grid and i have been working very uh, very deeply into the smart grid and smart metering scenario in uh, rp drp of ministry of power we had a very very sad experience uh, of uh, you know we talked about uh, gsm gps enabled modems uh, giving uh, remote data of the smart me or the meters uh, to the substation and to the servers <coughs> you know and every time the modem manufacturer or the uh, meter manufacturer was being blamed while nobody tried to realize that the sims that they have installed in that or a particular service provider which they chose because they were chosen on the l1 or m1 basis l1 i think everybody knows m1 is basically what who gives the maximum bribe okay so <laughs> uh, when you choose a vendor or a service based on this thing in scenarios and all those uh, scenarios what happens you do not look at the quality of service you do not verify whether that guy has got services in those remote areas where, where my products my nodes my meters are going to be installed if it is not there how do you expect uh, uh, you know any meet, uh, any communication to actually uh, deliver any services when there is no communication when there is no signal so in those kind of scenario if if the, we have a mvno kind of a model this is basically for uh, uh, you know attention of mr agrawal uh, because he can actually drive this thing then that mvno can have a back to back arrangement with all the service provider and it is mvno's responsibility to change the uh, this thing service provider back, uh, on a, depending on the quality of service at a particular node at a particular given moment if it falls particular network service falls because of qs falls uh, immediately one should be able to switch over to to the other one and that guy needs to have a back to back sls with all the service providers so that is one thing on the uh, whether it is for vehicle tracking whether it is for smart metering whether it is for any other services which are you know uh, you can say sim centric 
and uh, you know we don't know where the product would be actually located. This is one aspect on the infrastructure because this is where infrastructure fails. The one crucial. The other thing is one box type. One box for homes. I think one box approach is very very good. And that box may not be needing a SIM. It may be using simply the uh, your ADSL or or tomorrow fiber to home kind of a, a backbone uh, where the throughput is not an issue. So that but that one box. How does it work? And the challenge comes from one box to each smart node in each home or in each building. That is where the last mile or the last smart node connectivity, that is a major difficult area where there's a whole lot of diversity, confusion, and lack of standardization, lack of interoperability, lack of harmonization. OK, so we, we may have standards, different standards. They all are good. But, but how do we harmonize them? We need to define, I'm talking about India, I'm not a global citizen, I'm a local citizen. Okay, I have only focused on Indian market. And the way I look at it, we need to define our India way forward. That okay, in India, okay, we, on this particular layer, we'll, we'll go sub gigahertz, because Zigbee has been touted as a very good this thing. But in today's building scenario, where we have most of concrete and the, the thing, you know, you cannot cross two walls with Zigbee at 2.4 gigahertz, in spite of all the thing. And our sad part is, on sub gigahertz, we do not have spectrum. You know, we have 865 to 867 megahertz. We need a more bandwidth there, more number of channels. But then, uh, again, uh, for uh, 433 is still not licensed, uh, you know, uh, allowed for all these things. Hmm? Uh, so we need to define where, uh, when uh, somebody talks about uh, uh, your tire pressure monitoring, I think even 867 is not needed. We, we need to go down further lower at 433 or maybe even 169. Uh, you know, wireless MBUS in Europe is very popular at 169 megahertz because that uh, on water meter, they basically use 169 uh, megahertz. So we, we need to deliberate and come up with all those things so that first of all, we make a recommendation that okay, these are the bands needed. Then, okay, how to get the spectrum vacated and allocated, that's a government's policy. And I think government is very proactive on that part. That is one thing. Anything which is uh, fine. Thank you. So uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Now I will uh, hand over to uh, uh, Ranjan, you know, who is really at the core of the thing as a ZTE. I'm sure he has a lot of things to say about it. Uh, thank you, sir. First of all, you know, before going into the details of the questions, I think uh, three questions which uh, uh, Mr. D. Setraman has uh, has you know pointed out. I would like to take a broader perspective of uh, M2M. So talking from a broader perspective, there are f uh, four or five points which I would like to say. The, the first thing is M2M is essentially about creating the business proposition. It is about creating the ecosystem. Ecosystem involves a lot many things like standardization, uh, harmonization, etc., which you know just now Mr. Kishore has also said. Then it is also about creating the value for the end customer. Because the machines are, are not going to be the end customer. Machines are just going to be the machines. The end customer is going to be some personal user. It could be some enterprise customer. It could be you know government customer, or it could be uh, end of the day it could be some you know community of users. So it has to bring some value to the end customer. The the second point which I would like to say is that when we talk about tra traditional mobile broadband, then we can think of many bandwidth hungry applications. We can talk about mobile video, we can talk about you know, cloud services, hosting services, and many such applications. But when we talk about M2M, it is all about tiny flows which, are, which come from different directions. And we need to have that platform which is, which is able to scale up to take care of these uh, tiny applications. So capacity will remain an issue. We'll try to address that one in, in the later part. The third thing is the distribution of these connections is also going to be very high because you may not have the the the, the m term connections exactly from the locations where people talk on phone it could be actually anywhere it could be some moving vehicles it could be connected homes it could be coming from you know underground or anywhere so you will see a lot more distribution in terms of the traffic so which means that the the existing infrastructure it has to be scaled up with things like uh, things like uh, small cells or things like uh, uh, SON, which is uh, self-optimizing, self-organizing networks. So all of this has to be brought in. So all what I'm saying is the, the key is to have the infrastructure right, the endpoints also right, 
and all of this has to be done without impacting the existing human communication because we can't afford to have any disturbance on the existing human communication and all of this has to be done without making much impact on the network without spending too much money also. So the last point I would like to say from broader perspective is that you know uh, when we talk from 3G or 4G perspective so probably M2M can bring a lot of value because I, as I can see operators are investing heavily upfront in terms of 3G and 4G. I think la yesterday only the, the auctions have also you know finished and the people have have operators they have spent more than 60,000 crore rupees on spectrum only and on top of it they are building the infrastructure for 3G they are managing and operating them so there is a huge cost that the operators are going to pay so if M2N can, can bring some additional revenue stream it would be a great welcome for the operators for the telecom vendors and for the whole telecom industry as such now uh, I think this is where also you know uh, uh, this question was also read that whether the infrastructure is, is, is ready or not. So for infrastructure to be ready or not, I think we need to understand what are the requirements of uh, M2M connectivity. Because M2M connectivity may not have the same requirements as the human communication. First of all, the first key parameter of M2M is that it is uh, low data rate. We, we don't see you know, big data rates coming in. So we need to have the capability to handle you know, short packet size. Then the second thing is, the number of devices in a macro cell of a typical 2G, 3G or LTE network is going to be phenomenally high. In case of a normal macro network, the human subscribers that we see is maybe 1000 or maximum 2000. But in case of M2M, you will see tens of thousands of devices when it is really mature. I'm not you know, talking specifically about India current situation. Currently, I think we are not there yet, but definitely we need to have the infrastructure ready for next 10 years or 20 years, which can take care and scale up to those requirements. So uh, that is another aspect. So capacity is of the network that they can handle for M2M is going to be a constraint. Then the third thing is that the, the infrastructure uh, the, the, the infrastructure also, you know, uh, from, from end user perspective, you see the end user devices. Now we have uh, smartphones or now we have very fancy devices which can have, you know, uh, some, some battery life. We can afford to have some, spend some money on the battery life. But for M2M devices, you would like to have ultra cost, ultra low cost devices and also with very long battery life because you don't have the, you know, luxury or time to charge them again and again like the way we do our you know, smartphone charging. So these are some of the requirements on the infrastructure which need to, needs to be taken care of. And uh, at sea as well as you know, other standard organizations, they are all working on you know, to, to make sure that these things are taken care of. 3GBP started working on this in release 10 itself where at least about 15 problems were raised or 15 issues were raised. It was quite similar, I think, what we are, you know, currently doing, Mr. Agarwal said, that we have also internally in India raised some issues. So I think we should definitely take some clues from what HC has, you know, the issues which has been raised by HC, and those things has to be, you know, taken care of. So HC is the organization which, which from standardization perspe perspective, they take care of the umbrella, you know, uh, requirements. They take care of the functional architecture. They take care of, about the interfaces, the standardization. And then there are multiple other standards which follow the functional architecture prepared by HC. For example, you know, 3GPP has uh, its own standards, 3GPP release 10, 11, and 12, which uh, take care of the overall M2M requirements on the 3GPP networks. So uh, I think this is where I'll stop and probably we, we can take the discussion forward. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, now I'll hand over to Mr. Agarwal. I'm sure he already spoken, he has given his uh, views on this. So uh, sir, I would like to have your views on this subject at this moment. Yeah, thank you very much. <coughs> I have already covered uh, the infra infrastructure requirement as far as uh, telecom networks are concerned. Quality of service is the topmost um, uh, issue on these things because M2M requires uh, the reliability of the services. And definitely um, as a customer, as a human being, because M2M is going to, what, why, why ultimately we are going to have all these type of services in our country? Because ease of the operation so that uh, we can cover poorest of the poor. And we, uh, at least uh, in my opinion, we should focus on the rural uh, India. Only then uh, they can 
be really benefited. And of course, uh, we are from the government perspective, every government department right now is uh, focusing on um, M2M type of projects, whether I've already covered uh, smart uh, grid type of projects, but definitely uh, in each and every state, uh, two smart cities uh, are being talked of and government of India has already planned of these things. So my point is, is that once we are talking of all these cities, all these uh, smart type of networks, so we should talk of ease of operation from the persons who are not uh, capable of handling these smart devices. So for those uh, things, uh, I think, uh, in my opinion, DIT is taking some actions, uh, uh, developing local contents, de developing devices in the local uh, languages. English is the only medium being known in the, the urban India, and definitely, definitely, definitely only 10, 20 percent, but 80 percent of our population talk to the regional languages. So we need to have devices in the local languages also. Of course, uh, this is not uh, very correct as far as M2M uh, is concerned, because M2M don't, don't uh, need, need to uh, have the languages, but definitely right now we are using M2H, man to, uh, man, uh, machine to human. So, but definitely uh, these are the issues. And uh, uh, as far as uh, all these requirements are concerned, uh, so first uh, basic issue is ki we need to understand the uh, issues, uh, the requirements of the different uh, sectors. What is the what are the real requirements? Suppose in case if as I told you earlier, in case if we we, we foresee requirements from our side only, so then it is not going to serve the practical purpose. So for that purpose, different sector wise, we need to form the form the requirement having the associations with the industry as well as the users. Only then we need to come up uh, with uh, different type of uh, devices, different type of um, uh, requirements, and accordingly standards should be framed up. As I told you, ki our TEC is uh, TEC with C dot, and of course TSDI in India are trying to firm up the requirements so that they, those requirements can be reflected um, to the world body like ITC one M two M alliance, so that while making standards, Indian requirements can be taken care of. So this is, we, we cannot do in isolation. And definitely we cannot uh, ignore the what, what, is, what is going on worldwide. So um, till date, what happened, ki we used to simply follow what is being uh, developed outside the country. But right now, we need to reflect our requirements. And accordingly, once it is properly reflected in, a, in, the, in the total standards, then it is going to be a practical case for our country. And, um, and of course, um, uh, on the top of it, these are the human things. Um, on the um, we talk of the need-based requirement, whether is need should um, need should um, follow the require infrastructure definitely. So all these things will take care of the need of the human being. And of course, for these things, uh, in my opinion, which I foresee, ki one apex body should be there so that all these things can be very well coordinated. Ultimately, what is happening in the country, a lot of good things are being done. We are very experts in different, different things, but we are uh, doing things in isolation, in silos. So once industry, government, apex body is there, different, different bodies are developing different, different standards. BI is do doing its role. We are doing our own role. DIT is doing its own role. Some states are doing its own role. So all these uh, need to come at the same platform, including industries, and then understand the uh, requirement, and then develop the uh, systems accordingly. So then infrastructure will really solve the issues of the human being in general. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your useful insights. Now I would request uh, Dr. Shukla to provide her insights onto this subject. Hello, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my views on this topic. Uh, Fortunately, I have come from a background where uh, I have got an opportunity to be a part of majority of the implementation of e-governance project in the country. Whether that is uh, APDRP projects, we are part of smart city projects, uh, vehicle tracking, intelligent traffic management system. While doing the implementation, the things which we, unfortunately, I must say that all of them are failing. All of them are failing. Why? When we go into that, why? When we start implementing, we realize that the thing which has been, that the problem is in the conceptualization of the thing. As Mr. Agarwal has also pointed out, the same thing, that uh, we cannot follow a foreign model 
all of a sudden we have seen that okay there is a bus rapid transit system in the foreign countries and we need to follow the same model no first are our roads ready for that system are our people ready for that system is our government mechanism and our political will power is ready for that system no and we are not also at this stage that we even do trial and error every time okay one we are doing with apdrp then our apdrp will come up again i don't know what new will come up the smart <laughs> yeah smart grid pilots are there <laughs> yes so we need to see how we conceptualize the thing while conceptualization we need to take care of for whom we are building we have to have actually workshops and uh, i think there should be for public also there should be a lot of capacity building as well as workshop while we conceive this thing the government cannot appoint just a consultant and make a bed which is uh, much a copy of foreign beds and we we cannot do the projects in that way we need to conceptualize according to our own environment like we have gone for land records modernization a project this cadastral mapping which is a very close thing to indian population because 60% of our population is still thriving on agriculture and we have haphazardly built up a land uh, land use modernization program okay but again it failed most of the things uh, could not get implemented farmers still struggles to get okay their ror copies why because we have not done the capacity building for that we have not taken actual uh, woes of people regarding that issues into consideration so that's going to fail another thing is that political motivation for any of these projects to run successfully is very essential still our in our country i feel that uh, we lack that political motivation okay it is okay it departments are generally not that very important departments of state although we are trying to do a lot of e governance but where is the political motivation recently i have been in e uttar pradesh it was a much hyped program okay but when when it comes to the chief minister's priority no he didn't have that priority for that program so in in if, if there is no political motivation these programs won't get a thrust third thing which i observe is the uh, reluctance reluctance uh, and resistance to change in government okay people say okay we want to change but as they have not seen that using it how that is going to change it is a service it is not a product that okay uh, this machine will run in this way so service they don't understand how it will change them so first we need a lot of capacity building for them also that changes for their welfare otherwise all our intelligent transport system or smart city concept they are not going to survive like this and last thing i want to mention is that technology need to be tailored for the requirement of people because we cannot talk of a technology with people are, they, they, there will be a technology divide people will say that okay technology is something which okay it is not for masses it has to people consultants the it people who can know the technology is for people as they have adopted the mobile so they can adopt the technology also so it has to be friendly we have to bridge that gap through our policies only right thanks that's what i want to present thank you thank you dr shukla and uh, thanks all the i thank all the panelists just to summarize three uh, come two three takeaways uh, you know uh, one of course is a, uh, like uh, mr kishore has mentioned that mv and o and how to make this uh, a mobile virtual network operators behind infrastructure while infrastructure is there this is a good use maybe some white papers some uh, you know uh, some discussion groups to uh, create this awareness this one and also uh, you know um, i take dr shikla's point how to localize you know sustainability is the important point while we have a lot of technologies we have a lot of things you know i have seen some of them you know work some of them don't work in this uh, space okay so how to make them sustainable how do you localize how do you make sure that you know uh, it the service are helpful for the common man 
you know, I have seen wherever the service have been uh, useful to common man, they have succeeded. For example, simple things like ATMs or, you know, accessing some, uh, some simple uh, things, they have worked. But some of them have not worked. They may be very uh, interesting, but they are not worked because the common man is not able to use them for his benefit. So, uh, I would like to, uh, you know, um, stop here. And then also Dr. Shukla's point on implementation, you know, while we have a lot of technologies available, this very important important point to consider is how to make it low, how to make it useful to the common man, who is the core of the entire MTM infrastructure. So I stop here and do you have some time for questions, sir? I think we are missing one point. Yeah. Network network architecture we are missing. Yeah, okay. We did not touch that part. Yeah. And which is one of the very crucial aspects to this. And uh, on on this I think what uh, as a design engineer, I would like to m mention is, and what she ri rightly pointed out, uh, that we need to first of all define our requirements for each use case, for each application, each managed service that we want to deliver through the M2M or Internet of Things or whatever uh, you know uh, name you want to give this uh, uh, whole paradigm. Uh, we need to define the requirement because most of the designs f uh, do not work. I have seen as a design engineer simply because we did not cover all the points while defining the requirements. And one thing when we talk about different verticals, smart homes, smart grids, smart cities, uh, you know, the unfortunate part is every segment or every ecosystem, they are working still in silos. We need to come up with a unified and secure communication architecture, define protocols, define interfaces, define exchanges and security at each and every layer. That okay in India, this is the way we are going. Then let's see how we can harmonize. We don't need to do any uh, original R&D because a lo lot of global work, has, uh, globally, a lot of SDOs have done a lot of work. We just need to l learn from them and then see whatever standards we can harmonize. But we need to define. At, in, in each space, there are 10 standards. Which one will India follow? Are we clear about it? Or, or, or it is being pushed by every tech? In, uh, uh, what is happening in smart grid pilots, I can share with you. It's, it, it is simply, uh, I have been, uh, on most of the forums, I have been saying, what's the big hurry of pilots? Let's first define the way forward. Let's uh, sit down and work an architecture protocol define, and then we go for the pilots. But no, the, there's a lot of big stakes, of, uh, you know, pending people want to get some business to justify their jobs. Uh, and for that, you know, taxpayer money of 1,000 crores are going to go down the drain in the next two to three years. Smart cities, the Puducherry, it's, it's a laughing stock. It's a laughing stock. You know, I, I don't know who, it's ill-conceived, <laughs> ill-planned, simply because of, on whims and fancies of uh, someone. I'm a private guy, I, I can talk anyway, I, I don't have allegiance to anybody. So I, I always take the liberty of being blunt. So, okay, so the thing is this, why can't we first of all conceive what do we need, what, uh, what all needs to go in the smart city? Simply putting some smart meters does not make a city smart. You know, we need to define what are the essential services for, to make a city smart. You know, we need to talk about smart and green community. Not smart buildings, smart homes, smart this thing. And they need to look at the whole overall uh, this thing of energy efficiency, sustainability. All technologies have to be enabled towards the ultimate goal. For the architecture, I think we need to have special workshops in defining the different requirements then see how they can work together. Because in, uh, in our meeting, smart meeting, again, we had a problem. We took DLMS uh, uh, as a communication protocol. But again, for Indian use case, were a little different. So we had to come up with Indian companion specification of DLMS you know, protocol. What, what does it give us a lesson? It simply gives us a lesson that since we are late in following, we had to come up with that. But now, it is also a need that whatever uh, Indian flavors of each standard or protocol that we come up with, we need to go back to the global bodies and try to harmonize them at the global level. You know, we need a two-way part, not that simply attend to listen to them, learn from them, but also share with them that these are our pain points, so we had to optimize this. Can we harmonize it at the global level so that some other developing countries also might also benefit from these various things and we could make it global so that our products or even the uh, players who are working globally they have the products which they work in America, which work in Europe, which work in India also, seamlessly. Uh, because that's where, what will promote standardization. Yeah. Just, just, just one point. Just one yeah, point. Sure, please. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, just adding to what Mr. Narang is saying, all are saying in the same uh, way. We are all, all synced. But the only thing is, ki, let me tell you very frankly, the Shilpi came to me when they were organizing this event, ki why we don't uh, focus on the um, independent uh, individual industry verticals. And once what Mr. Narang is saying, ki basically we should focus on industry verticals. We should firm up the requirements vertical-wise. And then we should, uh, we should have a focus group on these verticals, then these uh, groups may interact with the concerned government departments and government uh, DOT can play the nodal role <coughs> as far as these meetings are concerned. So that's where we can put up our requirement forcefully. And of course what she, um, uh, Madam is saying is she's very right that way ki this should take the user's requirement also. The user, it should be a simple way. It should be simple to use so that actual, um, actual benefit can be given to the u users. So this way uh, requirements are formed up with the industry, with the government, only then these projects will be truly benefit to the industry as well as to the country as a whole. Otherwise, uh, the things will go on like like the same way which they are going. The smart grid, the Puducherry, of course, so, so many so other examples are there. So we should we should focus. The, the takeaway of this uh, group should be that focus group should be there and they should meet. Suppose Dr. Um, uh, uh, said in the morning time he is not aware what is going on in the government and I am not aware what is going on in the industry. Yes. So definitely they should come up and have a focus group of the doctors, maybe 200, maybe 50, maybe 20. They can come up with the requirements. They can they put up their requirements to the concerned uh, department who is responsible for the policy. So in a similar fashion, other, other departments can be taken care of. So th that way then we can proliferate. Right. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, yeah, I think. Yeah, just to add, you know, uh, what just we, you know, just now we heard. So I would just like to say, you know, customization is, uh, madam, very good. But at the same time, uh, just wanted to, you know, caution on the infrastructure side or, you know, uh, dealing with the standards. I think the, on the infrastructure side, there is there is no scope for any customization. We have to, you know, uh, harmonize and follow the standards. But definitely customization is possible on the preparing or making the applications. Because in India, the IT industry is, is, is pretty good. They can customize the applications exactly according to you know the requirements the hc has defined a very very beautiful you know architecture and they have given we have actually moved from a silo based you know architecture where there used to be a separate vertical or separate platform for each of the services so now that is uh, that is gone now we have a horizontal platform which can take care of you know all the uh, services so now this platform opens up open apis toward writing the applications so definitely you know we can customize the applications but we should not you know play with the architecture on ground. So that's what point which I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ranjan. I agree with him because uh, I, I, I come from IT industry. I have many years of experience where I worked with uh, government of India, you know, also. So I think I, they're very, um, uh, you know, um, I'm happy that the government of India had always this posture because unless you have a, you know, um, uh, interoperable open standards, you know, you won't uh, be able to do uh, justice to some of these applications in, in the infrastructure and so on and so forth. You know, I was in this open source uh, movement, open source, I was very much involved, interoperability, I was involved with the government, very thing. So it's a very good thing to do actually, because that's how you have a, you know, global presence here. Today, you know, India's uh, services, IT service business thriving because of that uh, government posture in, uh, you know, uh, adapting a, a global standard rather than a very specific local standard, okay? So I'm proud to say that, that yes, we have done a great job in that area. I'm sure uh, in this M2M space also, like, uh, like Mr. Agarwal suggested, I think we should really uh, come together as a group and then identify the requirements, each of these, maybe we should take some, some priority se sector to start with, and then we'll, there will be lessons from the priority sectors, whichever you said, maybe energy, healthcare, and you know, uh, maybe uh, another, some other telematics. You know, you pick some two, three areas, don't, don't boil the ocean, and then start working with them. I'm sure other uh, groups will get benefited by what we do in this uh, area. That's, I think, that should be the approach, I would suggest. And I, anyway, the group is very small, I stop here, and I'm sure the panelists will be here for questions, you know, we can always discuss in the, you know, in the tea break and so on and so forth. And uh, finally, I thank all the panelists for the great contributions and great insights into the entire uh, subject of um, M2M. And also I thank, uh, you know, uh, um, Shubankar, Shilpi and, uh, you know, uh, for the great uh, opportunity for all of us. Thank you so much. Maybe we can probably have uh, two or three questions from the audience.
Okay, maybe uh, I have uh, one incident uh, basically to share. Uh, it's almost uh, 10 years back, I was working on VDSL, and VDSL standard bodies uh, were already working on uh, the new standards. And um, we had an uh, you know, American band, we had a uh, European band, and uh, to my surprise, we also had a Chinese band. And because China was a big market, no manufacturers could avoid the Chinese band, so they had profile. They had a US profile, they had EU profile, and they had a Chinese profile. So probably the strength can come from different places. Probably our, our size and our uh, you know, population can also become our strength if you use it that way. That just, that's just an example that I have seen. It's almost 2002, if I remember correctly. So it's almost 12 years back. And probably we could use that as well. So if, if there are any more questions from the audience, I would like to uh, invite them. Yeah, so. Uh, uh, thanks. Sure, sure. I think you said, you know, I am actually from a Chinese company, Zeti. So, uh, definitely your point is right. In fact, if I, if I compare, you know, the M2M industry in China, it is already mature. So, almost like 20% of the devices now, of the global 2 billion devices, 20% of the devices, they are actually in China and they are using it for different applications. So I think we have a, we have a you know, similar scale, we have a similar demography, we have a similar population. So I see there is a lot of scope for, for India also to do you know, similar things. And I think we, you know, as, as uh, Zeti, we can you know, leverage those strengths and act as a bridge between you know, India and China to make sure similar things can happen in India, India also. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks.